race fans, welcome back to Off the Record. I'm your host, David Schildhouse. Joining me today are some part-time drivers that you may have heard of, and that's going to be one of the themes that we discuss in today's episode. Joining me, of course, the driver of the number 75 in the Camping World Truck Series, Parker Kligerman. We've got Preston Partis, a four-time Spec Miata national champion, and Brad Perez joining us from the cockpit of a race car because... Why not? Uh, a man who wears many hats is Brad Perez, and we'll dive into all that as well. But guys, I appreciate you joining me here uh, on the show today. Uh, we're going to talk about what it's like to be a part-time racer, because that's something that ties all three of you together. And uh, Parker, I want to start with you. You have so many jobs, and I think it's well chronicled at this point. For those who don't know, he drives a 75 in the truck series. Pit reporter for NBC Sports, host of In the Wall for NBC Sports, minority shareholder of Lime Rock Park, an actual racetrack, uh, and the owner or the co-owner of eRacer, co-owned that deal with Landon Castle uh, and Josh Mendoza. So covering a lot of bases, doing a lot of work, a lot of different ways, and you still drive a race car. How do you balance all of that? Uh, not well. Uh, I know Brad and Preston could tell you, like, it's uh, it's a juggle. And actually today is just one of those days where I was looking at my calendar and it's like one thing is TV, one thing's a call for racing, one thing's a get in the sim and drive some laps at Nashville so I can talk to my crew chief about the setup. Then it's like, okay, my to-do list is watch the Nashville race from last year. Okay, that's later today. Uh, you know, there's some other business things out there that, you know, sort of just looking at. And so I look at the whole day and I'm like, there's like six different entities all requiring some time uh, at the end of, the, of today. So it's really hard, but for me, it's really all centers around the driving side, right? And I think, you know, when we talked to Preston and Brad about that, I think for most racers, you know, you have to have that mentality if you want to get to the point of being where that is the primary focus. Um, but reality is in this day and age, you've got to do other things because, um, you know, one, it's, it's tough to make a living just driving Two, it's, you know, sort of balancing the risk, right? Like it's a risk. It takes an immense amount of risk to decide to become a race car driver that's physically and financially mentally, um, and then that risk continues and it gets worse as you get older, right? Like that's something where you've now given up time and effort and building, uh, knowledge in other areas. So if you can balance some other areas in there, uh, especially if they can benefit each other, I think that's a positive thing because you are at least setting yourself up, hopefully to, uh, to not be in a very bad position. Uh, you know, if the driving side doesn't work out and I think, it, you know, it's a tough thing because people say, you know, plan have a plan B plan to fail, but I don't agree with that. I think it's really intelligent in this day and age to have alternative uh, source of income or paths that you can, can go down in life so that you, uh, you know, you can really drive with a little bit of peace of mind, right? Like you can drive thinking, you know, if this happens and I can make it happen. Awesome. But if not, uh, you know, there's something else to do here. My father always told me when I was growing up and sometimes I listen to him and now, as I've gotten a little bit older, I certainly listen to him more as he always told me, it's good to have options, uh, <laughs> just for that very reason alone. So, um, yeah, juggling a lot of things, Preston, you come into this conversation, four time spec me out a national champion, got 15 Xfinity series starts under your belt dating back to 2019. You drive for Mario Goslin, DGM racing, but you also come from a racing lineage. Your father, Dan, uh, former cup Bush Arca Remax series driver. And we just see you pop up at road courses from time to time. We saw you at Coda earlier this year. We saw Brad at Coda earlier this year as well. Um, and you got yourself a TV interview, leading practice, sitting <laughs> P1 after uh, first practice there. It was really cool to see that because fans may not be necessarily as familiar with you uh, as somebody like Parker, who still races part-time, but they see him on TV more in other ways. So you come into this thing, you get that kind of exposure at Circuit of the Americas. What does that do for you as somebody who doesn't get a lot of starts? Um, I don't know. It's cool. It took, uh, I guess, 15 starts to finally get on TV. Um, but it was kind of cool. I mean, not everyone, like you said, knows who I am, um, especially in the NASCAR realm of things, uh, coming from Spec Miata, uh, which has no connection to NASCAR, I don't think, until the past few years. Um, you've seen people like Josh Balicki connect um, Miata racing to NASCAR a little bit um, just by the racecraft and stuff that's developed there. But uh, I don't know, like Parker was saying, I never thought um, for me more or less that I'd be in NASCAR. Um, although it was a dream of mine uh, with my dad racing NASCAR and all that. 
uh, it just, it never really connected. Um, we, I kind of moved back to Florida, uh, at a really early age. My dad got out of NASCAR when I was only four or five. So I never really got to, you know, live that, uh, but through spec me auto racing and stuff, got some good results, luckily. Um, and one thing led to another, uh, we were able to get into the Xfinity series and do some starts there. And Brad, we'll, we'll keep the, uh, the Hollywood, Florida native, uh, coming here, the, the Florida connection, Parker, you're from Connecticut. I couldn't tie that one in. Sorry. No. Uh, but, but Brad is also from Florida. Uh, and Brad, your, your rap sheet here reads like a very interesting resume. Uh, SCCA legends, cars, champ car, tire specialist for three seasons, a DJ merch guy for the band. I set my friends on fire. You're a dancing machine. You got two starts in the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series for the Rayum Brothers and one ARCA start with Josh Williams. You're sitting in a race car right now. Uh, you tried to reschedule because you're just trying to get that grind in to go racing. I asked Parker how he balances all that stuff. He said not very well. How do you balance everything that you take on? Uh, probably worse than Parker. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, actually had like a, a really big like meeting with myself like me and my five selves had a, a really good meeting yesterday so now we're going to figure out how to, to attack the next few weeks um just it's it's really difficult but but like parker said i think that's actually a really good point that he came up about not having a plan b uh i think probably like the best way to put it is like having that plan a and then having other options to make that plan a work better <laughs> um and that's kind of where i'm at right now um a lot has changed over the last few years i mean uh, when I first moved to North Carolina to try to be in NASCAR, I didn't honestly expect that I was going to race. I've always wanted to. It was always a dream. Uh, but I mean, I was like, if I'm just here and I'm working, like I'm, I am more satisfied than if I was just back home doing whatever I was doing. So um, now, I mean, I'm in a position where I'm really happy, like, even though it's, it's tough to be able to put together rides and, and compete and, and compete in the outside of the car space and then compete in the inside of the car space. Um, still I'm like super grateful to be here. So, uh, even getting able to be able to talk to you guys today is, is really cool. So this is, um, funny enough, uh, I met Preston at Homestead, uh, I think in 2017 or 18 or something, um, and watching him race. Cause I used to watch his YouTube videos. So I was super into the, the spec Miata thing before I raced spec Miata. And then also I met Parker at Homestead one time, I think it was like 2016, where I was just like, man, how do you, how do you do it? And then here, here we are. So, um, <laughs> it's, it's cool how uh, it all works out sometimes. Are you in an Arca right, car? I am inside of an Arca car right now. I, I thought so. Oh yeah. We saw you in that Arca car. We saw in that Arca car at Watkins Glen last year. Didn't go your way, unfortunately, but the common theme, every time you've jumped into a race car, Brad, an immense amount of support, immense amount of excitement from people, you know, trying to get die cast made, t-shirts sold, uh, saw you sign autographs. Everyone just gets so excited every time you jump into a race car. How does that make you feel knowing that, you know, even though the opportunities haven't been a plenty up to this point in your career, every time you do get that opportunity, it creates such a huge wave. Uh, in all honesty, like, um, what kind of makes the race car stuff like a little bit more difficult for me is that like, I'm a very low key person. Like I really, as much as I do tweet all the damn time, it's like, I would much rather just like not be seen very much. And like, I want to be, I kind of want to be that guy that like, I get in the race car and just figure out what I'm doing. And then like, nobody notices what I'm doing <laughs> as long as I'm not doing the wrong thing. But, um, but definitely I can't say enough. Like the fan support is insane and I don't really understand it for the most part, but I understand that, they like it because I do other stuff, I guess. But um, just in general, the what makes it really interesting to me is without the fan support, in all honesty, I am not here right now. Like I, I, the, the I set my friends on fire deal does not happen. It was like specifically fan support. Um, like any sponsors returning to me doesn't happen without fan support. So I could say directly, I haven't gotten to like the, the big money stuff. But I definitely, for what I have right now, um, I definitely owe it to the people who have supported me because I, it, it for real does not happen like at all. Well, it's, uh, it's exciting to watch. It's all part of the journey. Uh, so I want to dive into the, again, the theme that ties all three of you together, why I wanted to bring all three of you on for this episode. And that's the part-time driver lifestyle. Parker, uh, I'd say you're the most active uh, of the three. 
Um, you know, you run a select amount of races in the truck series throughout the year that you and, and Henderson Motorsports identifies as the ones that you want to race that you have a good opportunity. And every time you hit the track, it, it's top five, top 10 at worst. And, and that wind's been so close. And uh, I think you said it after Sonoma, it's just right there. You just need a couple of things to go your way and you're, you're right there. Um, and, and I just want the three of you to sort of discuss this amongst yourselves. How does being a part-time racer, balancing many other things and other racing disciplines and business, how does that impact your overall racing aspirations when, when that's all you want to do, you can't do it in a full-time capacity and, and you have to do all these other things just to make it happen. Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, I guess I'll go first. Cause I have the least experience with this. So um, as far as I'm concerned, I think uh, getting into the car or, or truck when you're not on the racetrack, like all the other guys, I definitely you're kind of at a disadvantage just out of seat time in general. So you kind of put a little bit more pressure on yourself to be able to, to perform at that level and, and basically observe as much information as possible in a given weekend where um, even though you might not have the same type of resources as the other guys, um, you still have to hold yourself to, all right, this is, I, I have to almost hold myself to perfection to be able to, to compete. I mean, I definitely for, in my situation, being uh, in a, an underfunded situation, uh, I feel like when I go out there, I, it's hard for me to want to overstep and being, being a rookie as well. Like uh, you see a guy that's like remotely as fast as you and you want to go as hard as that guy to, to try to like prove something either to yourself or to other people that you can do it. But you almost kind of have to take a, take a step back and just realize, all right, like I'm here to get experience. Like I need to, to be a sponge as much as possible so that when I do get that opportunity, um, you can make it worth it. And I feel like doing the part-time deal puts more of an emphasis on learning uh, more so where you know that, you know, this is your time and you have to, to relish that moment. Yeah. I mean, I'd agree definitely with what Brad said too. Um, with the few starts that we did the first probably two years of my Xfinity stuff, I mean, I did two starts in 2019 and then four in 2020. And it was kind of nice because knowing we had those few starts, um, it really allowed me to focus on just learning um, coming from Miatas and stuff. They're so different. And it kind of hurt with no practice and qualifying in 2020. Um, it kind of really just made me focus on just learning. I mean, kind of just building a notebook. So like when 2020, ah, 2021 came around, we had, I think, seven road courses in Xfinity that year, which obviously that's, that was unheard of uh, before <laughs> then. So it just, it allowed when that came around, um, I had a good half a dozen starts um, and we could actually focus on trying to get decent results. Um, and not just showing up to the racetrack and kind of being way behind as a beginner, I think was kind of nice. I agree with you both in that sense. And I think for me, it comes down to like a process and preparation. I've, you know, maybe a little different situation. You guys were, I've, I've driven full-time in stock cars for years. And so moving into a part-time capacity, uh, was almost, was by accident. It wasn't on purpose. It was sort of mixing, you know, all the opportunities I had at the time and hopefully getting into full-time competition where I actually, you know, ended up in the part-time because I, I had, I sort of said no to some opportunities because I felt like maybe at the time they weren't ones I wanted or want, felt like they were going to lead to places I wanted to go. And it seemed like the opportunity cost was too high to, to take them on and not do the TV thing at the time or that sort of thing. Right. So in hindsight, it was probably the wrong thing to do if you wanted to be a driver, but it's led to me to be in a position where, I've been in uh, rides that, you know, maybe were better than I deserved or, you know, was able to get into in a full-time capacity because I went part-time. So that's always helped me mentally. Uh, and then probably in the last like two years, I felt like one of the things I really worked on um, with my part-time racing was like my process and preparation of getting ready. And I realized I was like, I was treating it like as if I was racing full-time where I was doing it the week of, right. Which because you race full-time, you're racing every week, you would only have that week to prepare. Basically you start on Monday, it's with the SIM on, you know, the SIM and then Tuesdays, your debrief from the last week, you close the book on that one. And now it's in the next weekend. And it's all the preparation you can do for that. And when I realized, I was like, wait a second, you know, if I'm three weeks between a race, why am I not running laps on iRacing three weeks ahead of then? And like, why am I not building in an hour where I'm on the SIM running laps? And even if it's just 
trying different things that I've wanted to try or confirm things in my head or and building in that hour, almost like a workout session was been really big for me. And then that goes for watching races back and going to look at my old notes and sort of like building out a process that I use each time. Um, at least when I have the, you know, I'm given that amount of time off from actual driving so that when I show up, I feel, you know, just as prepared as someone who's been racing full time. Now, as Brad alluded to, that's a really tough thing, but like that has been a huge unlock for me in terms of what I felt like has driven a lot of success I've had in the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, a lot, some of that has come also from just running the cup level where, you know, the, the other levels are awesome and they're very high levels. And like, you obviously get to race against cup guys and they're very, some of the most competitive racing you can do in the world. And some of the toughest racing you'll do in the world, but there's nothing that prepares you for cup. And that starts, you know, for the level of preparation, those teams have the drivers put into it. Uh, the expectation of being, you know, almost perfect every single second you're around and step in that car and every comment you make has to just be at the highest level possible. And so I think knowing that and having experienced it and doing that part time that built to where I have this sort of this process and preparation that helps me a ton. But, um, you know, as Brad and Preston said, like it, it is a tough thing mentally just to show up. It is a lot of times, like, especially if you don't get those weeks in between, drinking water, you know, through a fire hose, essentially. Like I was uh, driving gateway, the next gen car for Rick Ware. I got that call Tuesday, late in the afternoon. I was on a plane first thing, 6 a.m. on Wednesday to go down there to the shop, sit in the car, check it out. I'd never even sit in a, sat in the next gen car and I get four laps in practice. It lights on fire. And now I got to go race. Like that is drinking to a fire hose, but I felt like some of the stuff I've been doing help that. So it's just a process. And, you know, there's no, uh, there's no substitute for seat time as Preston's learning and, and, you know, Brad as well. And I think you guys have both done a great job in your limited starts. Um, Brad, I was impressed with your speed at Sonoma. I, I checked it out and I was like, Hey man, that's pretty impressive hopping that thing. Just, you know, uh, for that level of equipment and such and, and be where you were. And then Preston, obviously I was, I was actually at some of your first starts, I feel like on the TV yeah. side, but I've seen your progression. You, you were quick, but maybe, the racing was a little bit different than you'd experienced, which we see oh, yeah. before, but you've definitely figured that out and, uh, and you kept the speed. So I think, you know, as you guys have seen, it's just a process. We're going to dive more into the part-timer life and road course racing, and maybe what some of the mentality, uh, may be for fan perspective, competitor perspective, and certainly the perspective of our three guests here stick around. You're not going to miss a thing on the other side of this break. You are listening to off the record. Welcome back to Off the Record, continuing our conversation with Parker Kligerman, Brad Perez, and Preston Pardis about part-time race car driver life. Now, I want to put it to y'all. Do you think that there is a stigma, whether it's from fans or your competitors out there on the track, about part-time racers? There was a time 15, 20 years ago, in the late 90s, early 2000s, road course ringers, right? They were like almost idolized. You know, you'd see Ron Fellow show up to uh, Watkins Glen or Sonoma and you'd be like, oh man, that's, that's exciting. And uh, before road course racing sort of became normalized in the sport and as Preston alluded to, just became a lot more prevalent in the schedule and everyone had to take it more seriously. Do you think that there's a stigma or, or negative opinion held by the fans or, or your fellow competitors about you as part-time driver or Preston, you specifically as somebody who's, traditionally been brought in to run road courses yeah i'll go um i don't think so i think it's like you alluded to before like you had guys like ron fellows for said they're almost like idolized for it back in the 90s and early 2000s um so i think it's kind of like well received obviously um i know when i did my first few starts um obviously i didn't have a big road course prep background like those guys did um it was just like me out of starts i remember going on reddit one time uh for my first start and i seen a guy comment saying I was going to be 10 seconds off in one of these cars because I had only had me out of background, which I mean, it does happen, but um, that was like the only negative comment at the time. So like yeah. every time I go to a road course or something, I mean, it's just, there's so many comments um, even like beforehand, everyone um, when they see me entered or whatever, it's, it's always somewhat cool. I get tweets and all that, but no, I don't think it's negative one bit. Um, it's actually cool. I think knowing my schedule too, or people knowing my schedule more, um, just because I'm not full time doing all the ovals, they kind of know it's just road courses, so they kind of single you out more, more or less. You're the modern right. ringer. 
No, modern not, not that's, that, that's how I view them. Like eight well, starts last year, seven of them on road courses, and you had some good finishes. I mean, at the Roval, you finished seventh. Yeah, no, we had some good days, and really, like I think Parker said, we had speed at most of them. It's just um, unforced driver errors. We had some mechanicals, but uh, it's part of the growing pain. Um, I think not doing the ovals. I didn't really know the racecraft um, drivers' characteristics, styles, and stuff, so I didn't really know off the bat what to expect and put myself in some bad spots. And it's funny because, you know, ra- road course ringers, I did a thing on this the other day where like road course ringers lasted until we realized it was probably harder to learn how to drive a stock car than it was to race road courses. Right. Like that's when that shift changed. Right. Press. And I think what's <laughs> interesting, you listen, you just talk is something Jim McMurray said at Portland on the broadcast, which I, I thought was fun about that. I can't remember the guy's name who was racing the Gibbs car, who was pretty quick. And he, he said, yep, this is what we see. They come in, they're really fast, but watch about halfway through the race. Suddenly two things will happen. One, it's the style of racing that is just sometimes absolutely may, absolute mayhem that like mm-hmm. you won't see anywhere else. And then two, and using, you know, a lot of contact. And then two, it's the fact that everyone knows they don't, they probably won't have to see you next week. And so <laughs> your level of respect <laughs> exactly. given is about yeah. zero. And yeah. I think that's one of the spots that I, I personally know I've done it. I, I can see times in my career where someone's come in and they're like a road course background. You're like a one-off guy. And I'm like, I am never going to see this person again in my life. Goodbye. <laughs> you know, here's the bumper. So, <laughs> no, exactly. like, and I mean, but like, I know that's a horrible thing to say, but it's like, that's the competition of it. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, I find it, have you felt like as you've done more races, have you gotten more respect? Is that like, something yeah, that no, definitely grown up. Okay. Yeah. That's so funny. like the first two starts, I definitely noticed that I got used to quite a bit. <laughs> the thing that's nice though, is like spec Miata. It's such a close uh, series. I mean, it's, it's not NASCAR. I mean, cars are way different, but they're still spec. So there's really tight racing. There's contact. Um, it's probably the closest thing you'll find to NASCAR in road racing. I think um, just, yeah, just not the cars, but racecraft yeah. and all that's pretty close. Um, obviously it's not frowned upon to have a lot of contact still, but, um, it's still there, but, uh, no, definitely. I think after the first few starts I did, um, like my first two, I, I wasn't around, uh, mid pack on up, uh, somehow in the next few starts I had, uh, track position wise, crew chief gambles and stuff. I dealt with a lot of the front runners, um, throughout the race, uh, and gained a lot of respect either through pointing them by or whatever. Um, Cause I've noticed literally probably the last half of my starts, there have been times when points paying guys could easily dump me if I'm on older, <laughs> older tires or what, and they just didn't do it. Um, I think when you first start off, that's definitely the case. So hit you every time you get, cause they don't have to deal with you. Um, yep. So I think the more they've seen me on track, obviously when you got more speed, you're dealing with faster people all the time. Um, so it's definitely gotten a lot better. Hmm. I think it's fascinating. Pretty, yeah, it's that's I love that. And the, the one thing I'll say uh on that original question, David, is just that I actually think it's been really interesting experience for myself to see sort of the fan support of the Henderson Motorsports number 75 I drive, obviously Food Country USA, and that branding has helped a lot, you know, keeping that consistent. But it's been cool to sort of see like the fans notice when we're there and when we're not and i think that's the one thing that really stuck out to me in the last five years of driving for them even when we you know in 2017 we ran up front we won a race we were probably it was probably our most successful year up until 2020 and 2021 and this year and it's been really funny because like my friend of mine the other day said you know when you were around maybe 2016 2017 he's like i don't think even the nascar fans knew who you were and even though i'd been there so long you know i had a falling but i don't think it was like to the level of being like I was consistently known for one ride or one spot. And even though we're part-time, I I remarked that at Martinsville last year uh, in October, whatever that the fall race was when I went up for driver intros. Yeah. I went up for driver intros and the cheers were so loud. I thought they were introducing someone else. And I was like, wait a second, (laughs) who's this? Wait, is this for me? Oh my goodness. So like I had not heard that and it's been pretty consistent uh, ever since. So it's, it's been really cool. I think, I think of like, I try to contextualize what we're doing to like what I saw when I was a kid and maybe like tried to think about, okay, what's a team in the early and the mid two thousands that was like showing up. And I knew when they showed up, they were going to be competitive. And like, you kind of pulled for them because they weren't always, you know, there every week. 
And I couldn't come up with like a ton. I, I can see them in my head, but I couldn't say like who exactly they were. And the only one I can remember was like the Wood Brothers when they went part-time in the Cup Series for a while. You saw that. You saw it um, occasionally in the trucks in Xfinity with maybe some Cup-only cars, like their, a Cup driver went and drove. So I think that's cool. Um, you know, it's getting harder, I think, for anyone in any of the three series to do that. Like Xfinity, it's almost impossible to be a part-time car with just how competitive all throughout the field it is. Um, and then cup, obviously the charter situation, it's, it's not existent. So it's, uh, it might be something unique, right. You know, going forward right now, at least in this time and age, just for the truck series. So it's, uh, it's just, I don't know. It's an interesting experiment in some respects to kind of see like how people pay attention and, and, you know, what they pay attention to within a series of, you know, 40 cars that they can pay attention to. Do you think that the 75 team has this, you know, aura about it and, and this intrigue to the fans about it. If you're not on TV, if you're not doing the NBC sports stuff, if you're just a part-time driver driving the 75, when y'all show up, do you think you have that same support and interest? You know, I thought about that. I, people ask me like, you know, doing the TV side of things, has it, does it help each other? Has it hurt each other? That sort of thing. And I've gone back and forth. I believe at the end of the day, they, they do help. And, you know, it, if, on the TV side, just driving and keeping myself current and really sort of mentally reminding myself what it's like to drive a race car and compete at a high level and, and race against Kyle Busch and that sort of thing. And then be able to jump on TV and talk about it. Like that is something I think is very uh, unique to me and that it helps me personally, just in that job in terms of the helping on the racing side. I think one of the things that's been that people wouldn't realize is that we share a lot of the same production people um, amongst Fox and NBC and that sort of thing. And I'm not going to say there's any favoritism, which there isn't, but it does help to know those people and be able to tell your stories constantly to them and remind them, Hey, I'm in this race. Hey, this is what we got going on. <laughs> and, you know, and just having a relationship with those guys. And I, you know, I'm not the only one, I know plenty of drivers. You'd be surprised to hear this. And I learned this obviously going to the TV side in the last couple of years, um, but I was shocked, but there's some really intelligent cup guys who were very early on in their career, meeting the production crews of the TV side and meeting, you know, taking the time to reach out to the pit reporters and the booth, uh, you know, people in the booth and really trying to make those relationships. And now have gone on to very successful championship winning careers and still do that to this day. And I think that's the part that really shocked me. And I was like, so I can say, yeah, you know, I had this unique situation, but I really didn't like there is there's drivers who have consciously done that for the last decade um, and it's really paid off for them. And it's simply human you know, psychology that if you have someone who tells you what's going on, you're going to remember that, recall that. And even though everyone comes and talks to everyone in the garage and I do that as a pit reporter, the people that consistently, you know, build a relationship with me, that sort of thing are obviously going to be the first and the top, you know, just naturally going to be top of mind when something happens, you see it and you think, Oh, Hey, this is what they just told me. So it is, uh, it's interesting. It's another interesting psychological experiment, I guess, in some respects. All right, Brad, there's the secret to success right there. Get in really good with TV people, get on TV yourself, Preston, you the same <laughs> thing, both of you. And that your, your, your careers are just going to skyrocket. Just, just be on TV done. Hey, well, you know, that, that whole premise, I mean, that what he explained there, like perfectly goes for like almost every facet of the sport. I think like for me being a tire guy, um, like I am tight with everyone at Goodyear and champion. So if there is any situation that there is any extra set of tires that is ever going to inventory or that are being turned in for no reason, they call me. So like, you know, situations like that, like I'm tight with a lot of the, the people who are the brokers that sell tires and stuff. And I, I got a deal at Sonoma simply because I know those guys and I talk to them almost every week. So, I mean, you could say that even with TV, you could say that on the, the back end side, you could say that with NASCAR social, you could say that with people who run the track Twitter accounts, you know, everything, you know, it's all about, you know, putting yourself out there and, and trying to, to be as well connected as possible. It's not always what you know, it's who you know, right? Open well up a lot of doors like that. Uh, so Brad, you're sitting in a race car. All right. You're in the middle of your work day right now, taking time to sit down and talk with us for, and we've talked about this theme a little bit on the show, uh, in, in prior episodes, but just the grind that it takes to get to the racetrack, to do what you want to do. 
Is that what you're doing right now? Are you laying some bricks or a little more foundation to get yourself back behind the wheel in, in a competitive situation again? Just tell the audience who may not be familiar with what it takes or even know what it takes to be a race car driver, let alone, you know, work for a team. How do you spend your time? What are you doing to, to fill the time between starts? Well, as uh, Parker alluded to earlier, it is all about risk. <laughs> um, so the risk for me is, like I am here by myself. Like I, I moved here away from my home when I was like 20 um, and, you know, lived on my friend's couch just so I could work in racing and then working in racing did not pay very well, still doesn't pay very well. Um, and then, but I did it because I wanted to be involved. Uh, and then now I've kind of worked myself to a situation where I have a pretty good paying job that I do part-time that it helped me pay the bills so that I can do the dirty work and be able to be somewhere here where I'm not getting paid to do any of this. Um, but I do it just because I, I have to, you know? And um, so it's half of that. It's half of trying to make a living and then trying to be able to give yourself enough time so that you can lay those bricks to be able to kind of like fall into a situation should that happen. And before me falling into that situation was like non-existent because I was not a licensed driver. I didn't have the experience. I didn't have not even the slightest connections to be like, uh, oh man, you just need 10 grand to do this. And I'm like, oh, seriously? Oh, I can't find 10 grand. Are you kidding me? But now I've kind of worked into my situation where, you know, where I've met other people who are like, uh, yeah, I can get 15 easy if I really needed it. And now I'm close to that, that realm at least. So um, laying that, laying those bricks long time ago has helped me lay those bricks now. And I think really my day to day is, Either I go to work at BMW and make some good money, then I come home or either go to the shop or start working on, you know, whatever I have to work on, uh, business related to, to help me do something. Phone's always on. It's always, I'm hoping it's ringing. It's not always ringing, <laughs> but um, definitely um, either going to work, coming home, doing that legwork or coming home or, or I'm having a day off. Like for instance, today I had a day off. So I've been at Josh Williams's all day uh, doing whatever that may be and, and just talking, chatting, learning, whatever it may be. And now we're going to go to the summer shootout later. Why am I going to the summer shootout? You know, who knows? You never know who you're going to meet. So uh, that and, and having fun with the people who have, have always helped me. So uh, it's life for me is super spontaneous because I, I do have a set uh, time to work and I, I do like have a lot of things that I actually have to do right now. But um, being able to balance that with a little bit of, free time to be able to do, I guess, business leisure activities um, doesn't hurt either. So I can't say that I have a super linear idea or path as to what I'm doing, but at least I'm here to figure that out. <laughs> You're doing things, right? You're doing yeah. things that doing you got to do something. So there you go. It's working. I mean, you got, you know, two starts already this season, possibly more in the future if things line up and work out. Um, and, and that's, I think the coolest thing about our sport is, you know, in baseball, in football, hockey, uh, basketball, I don't think that you can take this approach and end up in the NBA or the NFL or the NHL. In racing, though, you keep working hard, work for free, right? Work for free and hope you end up in, in the right situation. I mean, that's how I stumbled into the industry 10 years ago, 11 years ago, was working for free, volunteering for the Siegs in their shop when they were still a truck series team. Uh, and next thing you know, they're like, hey, you want to come travel? Cool. Next thing I know, hey, I'm up on the spotter stand. All right, well, great. I mean, it just, I don't think you can do that in any sport. And that's why I love racing so much because you can use your passion. And, and if you're okay with, with putting in the time and working hard, it can open doors and it can take you to places that you never thought possible. Um, and Preston, for you, the, the journey that you've been on, uh, doing all the, the, the Miata stuff. And we're going to talk Miatas uh, towards the end of the show. I got a question for both of you. Well, heck, all three of you can answer it, of course. But I think it was more specifically geared towards the two of you and uh, Preston, you and Brad. Um, just the path of racing runs in your blood. Like we talked about your father with a racing career. Did you know that you always wanted to be you know, a race car driver because of your dad? Or, or did he push you into that? Or did he just sort of leave it to you to figure out what you wanted to do? Yeah, so kind of like I said earlier, like it's weird because he got done racing NASCAR in like 03 or so. And that's kind of right when I was starting to remember, um, obviously you don't remember when you're one or two, but three or four, you kind of start, you know, making your own path. And uh, unfortunately we moved away completely from racing. Um, we went back to Daytona uh, and 
he actually became a real estate agent and I just started school, obviously at that age. So um, I'd still though, we'd watch races every weekend on uh, TV, every Sunday, you know, you'd turn on the cup race. And I probably did that for until I was about eight. And uh, I finally convinced him enough that I, I needed a quarter midget or something to drive. Um, and he was all for it. But what's cool is like, we didn't take it seriously. He never pushed me. Um, we never did a national quarter midget race, more or less. They got big events, like it's called the Grands back then, um, where tour the whole country and all that. We never went to one. We stayed at our regional track probably for about five or six years. Um, it was just something for me and him to do. Um, I don't know if he didn't want me to do anything else or what. But uh, finally, I, I grew out of that, and uh, we were looking at something to do. And as everyone knows, racing's so costly. Um, and we didn't have quite a bit of money at the time. Um, he was just starting a utility company um, at the same time. So we didn't have really the funds to go out there and do something like super late models or late models. I mean, that adds up <laughs> that's six digits at certain tracks if you're trying to tour. So we did Spec Neata, um, which was super friendly on the budget. I think Brad can say that too, until you get to the national level, it can add up pretty quick. But uh, on the regional side, it's the best bang for your buck. Um, you can go to awesome tracks like Daytona, Sebring and all that. And I did that probably for four or five years and didn't win like any nationals, didn't even podium at any of them. And then uh, I won at Indy, the runoffs uh, as my first race and first national podium. And uh, we started taking the racing a little bit seriously after that. Um, had some offers to do like the Mazda shootout and stuff and just financially didn't seem right. Um, and then luckily um, on the process, personal side, we were pretty good um, with the company then finally got, you know, it's foots, footsteps on the ground and all. Um, so in 19, um, we we're kind of looking what to do next from, uh, from Spec Miata. Uh, there's MX-5 Cup, there's a bunch of options and nothing really, financially seemed right um which is kind of weird to say it's just the cost so much to do a bunch of stuff and somehow i don't know why it seems logical but we got an xfinity car at the time um and we did our own family team and it actually worked out where we did the budgets and it it was pretty good compared to other series um and we kind of just did that and obviously it, it's blossomed into what we've done now Outstanding. So many ways to get into racing. I mean, you've heard it already here from our three guests, three very different paths, but uh, there's no wrong way to get into it. If you get into it at all, it, uh, it feels great. I can tell you that from my own perspective, my own ride, not as a driver, but uh, you know, certainly uh, as a mechanic and a spotter, it uh, you just never know where the opportunities may lie. We're going to continue this conversation on the other side of this break. Stick around. You are listening to off the record. Welcome back to Off the Record, continuing our conversation with Brad Perez, Preston Partis, and Parker Kligerman, talking about the part-time driver lifestyle, road course racing, paths into racing. Um, Parker, you have said previously on a, uh, a well-known talk show podcast that took place in a hot tub that you are driving better now than you ever have in your whole career. I remember when I, I was listening to that and I heard you say that, I it it didn't surprise me because I would agree with it. Uh, the, the on-track results certainly back that up. Um, but for an outsider, somebody who maybe hasn't paid as close of attention, how do you explain at this point in your career as a part-time driver that you are driving better than you ever have? Uh, well, it, I didn't intend for it to go this way. That's for sure. <laughs> I think, you know, I was just showing you guys my hero card from 08 and 09 where, you know, I, I ended up signing a development deal with Penske and won nine ARCA races in a season out of 21. And you would say like, and I sat in the pole for my first ever Xfinity start, which I think only 10 people had done before. Um, and I know a lot of people like look back at that and be like, well, that was the best. And I was like, yeah, I had the speed for sure then. And I felt like that carried into my Xfinity starts and trucks. And as I moved through my career, but I think the, the biggest thing that has occurred as I've gotten older, more experienced uh, that's really, you know, been shown to me is just, it's simply perspective. And that is that, you know, at that time, as I was coming up through the ranks and you go into something like this and, and I are fortunate, like I was at a young age to get big opportunities and, you know, and take hold of them and, and use them as a launch pad. I think I, uh, you know, I almost assumed 
and expected that like the next step was there that you know the next big opportunity was there and that winning and all those things were just built into the plan right like it's just going to happen because this is how good i am and everyone else agrees and that's going to happen and what you find out is um you know that's probably not the best perspective to have uh you know especially as you get into areas where you're having to you know do more with less and that sort of thing so I think, um, or I, I know back in 2020, as a end of 2019 into 2020, January, I, I lost my cup ride in the 96. And then my truck team in the 75 Henderson called me and said they were, they were done. So I basically uh, was 29 years old and had zero sponsors and zero rides. And I pretty much thought my race crew was over. So I was getting prepared to sort of like mentally be okay with that. And I thought I was. Um, and then I got the call from Henderson that they wanted to come back midway through that year. And I said, why not? Right. Let's, let's just do some more. And maybe it's like a, a goodbye tour, right? Like we'll see where this goes, but one thing led to another and they, you know, were, uh, you know, were amazing in reinvesting in the team and getting, you know, improving things. And we just started to have great result after great result. And a lot of it, you know, from my side, was just when I got that opportunity to come back at Pocono in 2020, I just sort of looked around and promised myself that I would enjoy it and that I would, you know, not let it, not take it for granted. And that if it was the end, it was the end and to just do the best I absolutely could. And so I left, if it was over, you know, by the end of that year or whatever, or the next race, you know, I felt like at any point, any race at that time could have been my last one. I would leave it thinking, okay, I did the best I could, right? And I, I had fun with it. Um, and that sort of just unlocked something for me mentally that has allowed me to really enjoy this again, to really lean into, you know, the, the processes as I alluded to earlier, the preparation, and then to see the results on the racetrack and to feel it in the seat and see, you know, make the moves and make the decisions and, and get the opportunities because of that. And it all snowballs uh, is a really cool feeling. And, and I think it's just, it really boils down to perspective and having a change of perspective that you could only get from experience and being older. And therefore I have this belief that right now I'm driving the best I ever have. And if, if motorsport analytics and David Smith was to be uh, trusted, the peak productive year for a stock car driver is age 39. And so that means I got at least what, eight more years to go, uh, almost a decade of, of increasing performance. So hopefully uh, I get that opportunity. And if I don't, you know, as I allude to, I think from that day onward in 2020 at Pocono, not a day goes by that I don't appreciate and I'm grateful for the opportunities to be in a car um, that I know that I'm doing my best I can. And I'm, you know, I don't want it to stop, but if it were, I'm, uh, you know, wholeheartedly knowing I, I left it all on the racetrack. That's fantastic, man. I love that. Like I sort of, you know, I've, I've had that same perspective and it, it wasn't always that case for me. You know, I had to get a little bit older to, to understand that and, and take that same perspective as, you know, certain hobbies of mine took off, you know, with streaming on Twitch and sim racing and things like that. And, um, you know, having a platform I never had before. And, and I always sort of told myself, this could be the height of it. This could be the best it gets and it could all go away tomorrow. And, and I'm going to treat every day. Like, you know, this is, this is the greatest thing because it is. Um, and, and so that's, that's good perspective to share. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and I hope you have 10 more years left in you, whether it's part-time full-time, whatever series you're in, it's just fun to watch you race and, and the, the passion that you bring, um, you know, and, and I think it inspires the younger generation. I don't know, Brad Preston, do you, do you, does that inspire you when you hear from somebody like Parker, who's been there, done that at all levels, what he has to say? No, exactly. And I think, I think everything you said there, I can almost relate to it, not on the NASCAR side of things, but um, on the spec Miata side of things, I took that as a hobby for so long. Uh, I kind of put this thing as, as just me and my dad, were going to do it each weekend or whatever. Um, obviously financial wise, um, I, it kind of, it's not as bad, the burden of it. Um, so you can kind of see yourself do that in the future for a while. Um, but I kind of got to a point where, like you said, I, I kind of, I don't know, it was like a switch or something happened where just, I won my first championship and I'm like, you know, if I end, you don't know when the next race is going to be basically, um, it's kind of where I'm at with it. So like every race I do, even if it's Miata's, I expect that it could be my last one. 
and oh crap you just lost me no never mind no nope, you're I there my, <laughs> my zoom canceled on it um no i just even like me out of side like i don't know when it could be my last race like when i won my first championship i didn't win anything before that i'm like everything's gonna come easy now i mean it must be that simple whatever i just did and literally it took me like three years to win a next championship after that and like i i won that next one and i just i mean i didn't take that for granted um you know celebrate with the guys or whatever and all that and then like you said it kind of just snowballs together but as long as you don't like think it you're you're gonna have that next start just like given to you um you kind of almost just got to take everything you, you can't take it for granted basically yeah i'm i'm kind of in that phase entirely about every day of my life because uh the the fact that i never thought i would get this far like i um my racing career is definitely a lot less starts than than most of the people that i'm around um like when i started the first time i drove in a competitive wheel-to-wheel -wheel race i was 17. um so the first time i drove a race car and that would be miata i was 20. so um being able to to be in this situation i definitely i'm still kind of in like the twilight era of like you know even walking the driver intros or, or walking over to a truck that has my name on it still like it, it still kind of makes me a little emotional but then i also have to fight with the the idea that like i i, I need to be getting better like um and honestly hearing preston's story because preston told me his story about how he like he had so many starts in spec miata and hadn't even podium the national race until he won his championship and sometimes i like even in miatas when i was driving like my ass off and i would finish ninth and i'm like damn it like you know i'd be so mad and then i, I just remember like you know it, it takes time you know i i know obviously even in in sonoma like i was su super under driving i felt like if if somebody better was in that seat we'd finish probably I could say even probably five spots better or something like that. So um, knowing that and and knowing that, okay, I have time to get better. Like I have, I'm only 25. I know it feels feels old in the, in the realm of NASCAR when you're racing against a lot of teenagers, but um, knowing that I have all this time to, to improve on myself makes it a little less uh, stressful when kind of I'm fighting the, wow, I'm stoked to be here to the, wow, I really want to win right now. <laughs> the craziest thing to it, like, I mean, I'm, like Brad said too, I don't think we expected to ever make it to where we were at. Because I remember when I actually first met Brad, we were watching a global MX5 Cup race at Sebring. Um, and it, I went to go watch my friend Celine race. And I don't know if Brian Brad was there. I think probably the same thing. And like, if you told us then we would like even be a NASCAR, because I didn't even know Brad was a NASCAR fan um, at the time. And it's like, just even imagine that we both even had a start in NASCAR, let alone it's crazy. I'm sure if I told Brad back then, hey, he's going to have two truck starts and he's going to have a <laughs> career in NASCAR being a tire guy or something, he would have probably just said I was insane. Yeah. But it, it's it's crazy when I look back on that um, and just see like Brad's story, especially. Like, I think it it proves kind of the point where you don't have to come from money um, to make it into the sport. Um, like Brad said, like he's an inspiration to me more or less um, than anyone just to see how he grinds uh, I mean, he moved to North Carolina. He didn't really have, I don't think, a set path. He didn't know where his, his two-year goal was, three-year goal is. He just went there to learn. Um, and it just shows how connections can make you grow as a person um, and end up being in the race seat, which is cool to see. It's it's fun to watch your friends do cool stuff. I, I That's been something I've been sharing with people over the past few years as I've gotten to know a lot of folk in the industry better is and i've gotten to you know call them friends and, and see the cool things that they get to do like you know like brad or or anybody it's just like man i know that guy he's on tv yeah. brad's getting interviewed by michael waltrip right now while he's up on on jack stands but they're interviewing him like that's the greatest thing i i'd seen that like, was an amazing it was just, interview. Yeah. it was great it was great i love it so it's just it's super cool and, and and those are the moments that i really hope we see more of in motorsports going forward and and parker you always tweet about uh you know motorsports in america with the rocket ship emoji right for for those who haven't seen it before or maybe don't understand and, or what you can't fit into 160 characters in twitter what what does that mean when you tweet that what does that mean well i just think there's been an enthusiasm around motorsports uh in the last two years you know post pandemic and i think 
some of that has been driven obviously from the formula one side of things which with its explosion and drive to survive and what that caused and, and has continued to you know show great growth in that sense but to me i think what we've learned as opposed to when nascar was growing in in the mid-2000s to its peak or the champ car or the PPG IndyCar World Series was the biggest thing in the world and nipping at the heels of Formula One back in the mid 90s is that all these racing series are actually not competitors, but they're working, you know, together uh, or they're working towards the same goal, which is more people watching motorsports. And so my whole thing about the Motorsports in America with Rocket Emoji is like, we're obviously seeing a growth across all motorsports, whether it's TV ratings, attendance, sponsorship inflows compared to you know five eight years ago when it was pretty bleak time um and obviously you know that has great positive effects for everyone but to me just the biggest thing is just that all you know a couple years ago nascar and indycar came together and said we're not competitors we're working together right we saw that with double headers which was a cool thing and you know that was really spearheaded by everyone at nbc but it it proved to be instantly a big hit and have a huge ramifications for IndyCar and NASCAR to getting those fan bases to sort of view this as like, Hey, this is cool stuff. Um, and then you have drivers jumping around to all the different series, which is a cool thing. I think that always helps. And that's sort of something we've all wanted to see us get away from that mid 2000s specialist era where drivers didn't jump around. Uh, you know, it's been really cool to see Fernando Alonso do he's doing the project 91 deal led by Justin Marks, which I think will have some really big names throughout the world. The motorsport come and try NASCAR and vice versa and see NASCAR to go to Le Mans and you see Jimmy Johnson going to IndyCar and IMSA and it's just, it's happening. Right. So there's an enthusiasm, but most of all, I think for the first time, it's not an enthusiasm centered around one, although people like to say it's Formula One. This will have ramifications for all motorsports, and that's why it's motorsports in America, Rocket Emoji. Love it. Absolutely love it. That's uh, that's that's what you can't say on Twitter. There's just not enough space to say all that, but I wanted <laughs> to hear it from you because I love your passion about it. I know you're very passionate, and, and you get to cover a lot of different things. You get to see a lot of different things from a perspective that not everyone does. So, uh being able to share that knowledge and, and, you know, teach, I think in a certain way, teach people uh, and educate them a little bit as to the bigger picture is, uh, is really cool. So we're going to wrap up today's episode with some questions from the audience. I put out there on Twitter a couple days ago, you know, let them know who we had on. We got some questions from the world at large. Uh, so we're going to fire off for our spec Miata guys, Brad Preston. This is from Bozy. He wants to know, what is the best Miata? Oof. That's a multifaceted question. Yeah, there's generation gap. I think yeah. Brad can say this too. The NA and NB are basically together in a way. And then NC is like different. And then ND, yeah. the new global car is totally different. So I think the greatest era of Miata is probably the 91 through the 04, which is spec Miata. Um, it's one of those cars where it's got no assist, um, no traction control, because they don't make more than 120 horsepower, so you don't need it. But they also don't have ABS, um, so it makes it a really fun car to drive. H pattern makes it really fun, super light, and provides great racing. So I think that's uh, yeah. my favorite. Yeah, I think as far as the cheapest thing closest to a stock car that you could drive is if you put a brake booster uh, delete, on your NA or NB Miata, because you you do have to uh, shift with an H pattern. Um, I mean, if you're going to call it old school, you do have to heel toe your downshift. You obviously don't have to do that now, um, and you have to hit the brake pedal super hard. So um, <laughs> definitely, uh, I would say my personal favorite is the NA8. So the 97, 98. Uh, I would call. I think 96 also is included. Miata, that'd be my favorite. I do love the NA body style. Um, I do love the big power a comparison. Big but, power. Uh, uh, big power. That's, that's what stood out to me, I, the big power version. I on a relative first, basis. I drove one for the first time at Lime Rock last year and had a blast. Those cars were so yeah. much fun. Uh, yeah. I mean, the ra- it was one of the best races I've ever been a part of in my life. Last lap, last corner pass for the win. It was the coolest thing. But just at one point in the mid race, I remember just smiling 
being like, this is hilarious. <laughs> I just like, yeah. these are so fun. And you're driving, like you're working those things. Oh, it's yeah. wild. I, think, I love it. Yeah, we talked about it at Indy, I think, before yeah. the race for the NASCAR weekend. And it's <laughs> one of those cars where like, I love it so much because there's so many entries. I mean, like at the runoffs, we get 90 cars, um, more or less. I think we've done it twice now. And anyone in the field is going to have a race with somebody. I mean, it might not be a battle mm -hmm. up front, which usually is. I mean, there's probably five or six cars. Mm -hmm. Top 20 can win that race, actually. But literally, you can go to 45th, and probably 45th to 55th are within a second of each other racing the whole time. And I mean, I don't know how many other racing series have that. Um, obviously, the cars might not be as thrilling um, from the spectator's eye, I just going fast and all that. But just how they drive, I mean, you're on the edge only 45 minute races at the most you can't make mistakes and stuff it it's just it's so much fun and i and i love going back to it and i've been obviously doing the xfinity stuff but on the side to stay not as rusty i've been doing a lot of miata stuff and it's, it's just so much fun it looks like fun i mean that you know i, I hear plenty from people oh man i just want to go get a miata and go race with it, it just yeah. looks like a blast so that and might be a good starting is, point yeah i was about to say you got to get in one um, you know they're <laughs> they're kind of affordable it's Probably. in my house. If you want, yep. they, there is two spec Miatas sitting at my house waiting for somebody to drive it. Don't awesome. tap me with a good time, Do Brad. I, I, I will take you up on that. I, you know, the people say, well, when are you going to jump in Huffman's late model? Like Blake McCandless and Travis Moonhead Brown are like, oh, listen, I don't know if I'm going to go to that length. If I could jump into a Miata, that, that, you know, that could be okay. I could go I mean, that The route. best thing too about Miata is if you tear it up, you go to the junkyard, you get the parts and another you it back on it. I mean, it's not like... <laughs> You go tear up a you know a late model or something like that it, it adds up pretty quick but that's what's so nice about miata racing um i mean you can just get parts cheap and realistically there's so many beginners out there that just start their career um through a miata and obviously they'll grow it somewhere else but uh it's just on a budget it's probably the most fun you can buy all right last question and we'll wrap this thing up parker this one's for you uh this comes from somebody on twitter with the name eraser uh, they want to know when is the firecracker 400? Good question. I do too. Uh, I, I, I do too. Um, as soon as we can possibly lock all this down, I think uh, it's no secret that Landon Castle is far more busy this year. Myself is far more busy this year. Um, we centered all our resources on trying to make the firecracker the biggest and best version of itself yet. Uh, but with that, we want to make sure that it gets that treatment. And so it's been hard to fit in the, find the dates to put this three week event together, but I think we're getting close. We should be close to hopefully locking down some dates and announcing soon. It's probably not obviously going to be in its traditional time period, but maybe it'll find itself even closer to the, the now where Daytona's, you know, end of August basically. So, uh, uh but I think people will love what they see. And for all the competitors out there, we love that everyone's asking. Thank you. And we are really excited to bring it on. Hopefully all the fans will enjoy it too. And we have some pretty cool, innovative things that will uh, be a part of it, but it is, uh, it's a massive undertaking. And unfortunately we, as we've alluded to in this podcast are pretty, pretty uh, busy. So we've <laughs> had to, we just want to be respectful to it though, because it's like our baby. So, you know, we want to make sure it gets the treatment it deserves uh and therefore we just we've got we've had to shore some things up and find the time but i think we're, we're close to it no small undertaking to do a three-week show in the sim racing world to the level that uh eraser has done their firecracker 400 certainly something i've enjoyed being a part of and uh, look forward to seeing when it finally comes together this year <laughs> jumping back in with uh with you parker and with landon and everybody there at eraser to do that but that'll do it for uh, for our episode today i appreciate you guys coming on talking about all this stuff uh really was a a great conversation and for the audience out there if you want to get involved in next week's episode get a question asked to our panel which will be revealed at a time later from now uh, you can always check uh, out on twitter of who the guests may be but put some comments down below if you're watching on the youtube platform and if you're listening on spotify uh head on over to tobychristie.com's youtube page and provide some feedback there you never know your question just may get used but we appreciate you tuning in and a big thank you to my guests today parker Kligerman, brad perez and preston pardis i'm your host david Schildhouse. thanks so much for listening we will see you next time we go off the record